You know, we look at the diversification of energy. We listen to His Excellency the Minister this morning and to Dr. Sultan al Jaber talk about what has been happening here in the UAE. But when we look at the perspectives of oil and gas and we look at the situation right now, the volatility in the market, the uncertainty, the high price, the new demands for more energy, you know, what can we do right now in terms of making sure that the diversification is on the right path? In the UAE, um, let me start off by uh, uh, reminding everybody that last December, we uh, celebrated our Golden Jubilee for the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's been 15 years since uh, the uh, uh, UAE has been formed. And uh, starting from the end of 2020 to uh, the entire year of 2021, the government and all the ministries, we were working very uh, aggressively in terms of identifying our plans and strategies for the next 50. Uh, out of all the activities that we did within the different ministries, actions related to climate and energy uh, took the top priorities in our national agenda. As uh, Minister uh, Suhail mentioned uh, this morning, and Dr. Sultan, uh, the UAE is uh, pro-climate and pro-growth. Uh, in October also, the UAE was uh, one of the first countries in the MENA region to announce uh, its strategic initiative for a net zero by 2050. And also during COP26 in Glasgow, uh, the UAE joined the Global Methane uh, Pledge, where we pride ourselves to be amongst the lowest countries with methane intensities of 0.01%. Um, our dependence in the UAE on oil uh, that has come up as a lot of questions. And uh, I want to clarify over here is that we are amongst the least countries in the region that are dependent on oil. Uh, only 30% of the country's GDP does come from oil. Uh, over the past uh, several decades, we have uh, invested heavily in economic diversification programs. And we have focused on uh, non-oil related sectors such as manufacturing, construction, real estate, aviation, and ports. Um, moving on now to the global demand of oil. Uh, and uh, currently we are closing in on to, in terms of the pre-pandemic levels of uh, uh, demand, close to 100 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, and uh, I want to touch upon a very sensitive topic, which is uh, peak oil, peak oil demand. Um, there are a lot of organizations, institutes, individuals, uh, thought leaders that have their own theories and perceptions of when peak oil will hit. Some, uh, even today, believe that we are at that stage. We are at peak oil. Uh, others believe that over the next 10 to 15 years, that is when we will see peak oil. Now, regardless of whichever scenario you see, uh, the demand and the requirement for oil and gas will always remain. It's not just simply going to disappear. And that is why I go back to what our keynote speech uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Sultan and uh, Minister Suhail is related to investments. Investments must do continue in the oil and gas sector. We are seeing very difficult times today, unprecedented gas prices. Uh, in my two years in the ministry, I have met with a number of delegates from different countries that are so-called pro-green. And it is amazing to see a shift from these countries in terms of their strategies, in terms of their policies, where previously fossil fuel-based energy was a no topic of discussion. Today, all of a sudden, it is uh, right in the mix of things. Today, we see some of these countries actually reverting back to coal. Today, we see some of these countries actually subsidizing fuel for their citizens. So this just proves one point, which I'm really homing in on over here, is oil and gas will remain as part of the overall energy mix. Investments must continue in the oil and gas realm. And I think that's a message that we'll hear from everybody. I think you're in harmony in terms of that. Mr. Barkindo, um, uh, His Excellency Suhail actually talked about the Superman hero. I mean, in terms of OPEC, you'll always be our Superman. But there's, you know, great focus on oil and gas right now. I mean, countries want to diversify. I think everybody is looking to get to net zero. But how important do you see oil and gas for 
you know, many years to come. And even that midterm could be a bit longer than people might have anticipated. Uh, thank you very much, Etna. And uh, let me also join others uh, in thanking Atlantic Council and their excellent team for bringing us back in person uh, at this forum that we missed uh, last year due to COVID. Uh, we are glad that we are back here uh, in what uh, others call interesting and historic times. Uh, and I'm glad to participate with this uh, distinguished uh, panelist uh, to talk about this uh, topical issue. The role of oil and gas uh, is uh, guaranteed for the foreseeable future. We have had speakers this morning in several panels, including uh, Minister Suhail al Mazrui and Sultan al Jabr, uh, pontificating, if you like, uh, for the upteenth time uh, that the science of climate change, the energy transition is uh, really not a transition from one fuel to another. And two, the world will continue to require all sources of energy. What is required at the moment is to revisit how we explore, we produce, uh, we refine and distribute and consume hydrocarbons uh, to bring them in line with uh, current realities, especially in terms of sustainability. The energy trilemma that uh, both ministers and several speakers, I think, made reference to of energy access, affordability, and sustainability uh, should be taken in a holistic manner. And oil and gas, uh, according to our world oil outlook, which I believe many colleagues uh, in the room are familiar with, uh, will continue to account for more than 50% of the global energy mix uh, to 2045. This number had not moved uh, uh, immensely in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, why? Because population has been growing uh, uh, rapidly, over 3%. We project that uh, population will grow by about 20% between now and 2045. And the vast majority of that growth will come from developing countries where energy poverty is already endemic. Uh, and therefore, this access issue that has been uh, uh, passed by the UN uh, as a right, uh, not a privilege in the SDG 7, uh, must be taken seriously in pursuing our transition goals. Now, we in OPEC, as we have said, times without number, are not climate deniers. Uh, we are part and parcel of this conversation, and almost all our member countries, Etna, are taking uh, measures that we refer to as no regrets measures in accordance with the core principle of the UNFT Triple C. Uh, the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and uh, respective uh, uh, capabilities. I'm very glad to see uh, Ambassador Dobryansky in uh, the, the audience uh, who had led the U.S. delegation in these critical discussions and took us on board as developing countries uh, in the most uh, inclusive manner that you can expect any leading country should do. Now, and we are very glad this morning to hear from the incoming uh, COP28 president, Sultan al Jabr, uh, that he is going to follow uh, suit uh, in the uh, footsteps of uh, Paula and her colleagues in the US to make sure that the COP28 here will be an all inclusive COP where no one will be left behind. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, of course, because there's so much, I think, to talk in that area. Dan, I mean, you're in your role now with Sempra Infrastructure, of course, so, so gas is good. Um, uh, talk to us about, you know, where America is, is looking and how it has changed, because in your role previously in the energy department, you know, you could see, you know, what was going on there. 
are they in just, I mean, such a confusing, confusing situation at the moment that, um, you know, there's a lot happening, but is it going to be three steps forward now in a hurry and then we'll all have to pull back again? Um, what can the U.S. do? There seems to be still a lot of hurdles in terms of, you know, their policy and what they need to be doing. Well, thank you. And, and thank you to the uh, Atlantic Council for hosting this summit. And uh, I, I echo the comments of the Secretary General. Thank you for doing it in person. Uh, it's wonderful to see everyone again. I, I do think the American energy policy is still being formed. Uh, the new administration is still in a period of transition, if you will, perhaps not energy transition, but just transitioning to a new government. And they're still trying to find what their long-term energy policy will be. I don't know, however, that the country will deviate very far from where it's been in the past, and that isn't all of the above energy policy. It's very important that we understand the history of energy transition. So as the Secretary General just mentioned, oil and gas will be an important part of the energy portfolio of the world for a very, very long time. And if you, if you just study energy history for a second, you'll realize that the transition is often not from this to that, one form of energy to another form of energy, the transition is really from less to more. It's more energy because that's what's needed to drive these, these economies all around the world. And more importantly, I think, it's from less energy dense sources to more energy dense sources. So when you look at the world, you look at wood, the transition from wood to coal, to gas, to oil, to nuclear technologies, it's been a steady transition and that's going to continue. The question then becomes, as we look at 2030 goals and 2050 goals, whether or not we're going to have a transition to 100% renewable technologies. Well, there will be some transition to renewables, uh, but renewable technology as we know it today is less energy dense than nuclear technology or oil and gas. So you can't see it replacing anything else. So as we think about you know, where we're going to go in, say, 10 or 15 or 30 years from now, you still see a vital role for oil and you still see a vital role for natural gas, because in many cases, it's the perfect complement to some of these renewable technologies. So as we look at the United States, I think the United States, the, the private industry in particular, stands ready uh, to help fill any gaps in the marketplace. I think the producers are ready and willing and able to fill any of those gaps that may present themselves. Um, but you know, I guess the, the, the short answer is, I don't see much changing in the near term with regard to U.S. energy policy. It's going to be all of the above. And when we look, Halima, to, you know, 2030, 2050, I mean, clearly the world is going to be a different place, one way or another, and the energy market, yes. But will there be any more stability in the energy market, you know, when things are going to be different, whatever they're going to look like? First of all, it's wonderful to be back, and thank you, the Atlantic Council, the government of UAE, for hosting us again for this event. But I think it's really important to think about an energy transition does not mean lower prices. It means potentially more volatile prices. And I think what we are seeing right now in terms of questions about supply shortfall, I mean, this was already a tight oil market, you know, tight energy markets as we were having this global reopening and we had, you know, questions about insufficient investment to, you know, surge production. That was before we had this whole crisis with Ukraine. And so as we look out to the transition, the key questions I think need to be made now are key answers now about how much we're willing to get behind natural gas. Obviously, we have governments now in Europe. We have stronger statements from the U.S. government about the importance of natural gas. I actually think we're now getting sort of back to the idea that we are the all of the above, as President Obama talked about. I think before there were question marks about really how much support there would be for natural gas. But as Amos brought up in his closing statements, I mean, this transition, as we think about renewables, there are going to be a whole host of geopolitical issues around renewables. You know, real concerns about critical shortfalls for the critical minerals that we're going to need to, you know, fuel this transition. Issues about who controls supply chains for these critical minerals? Questions about, you know, which country is the dominant producer of graphite, not only for production, but also for refining? That, that's China. And right now there is no replacement for China in terms of graphite. And so there are going to be all these questions about the geopolitics of renewables, questions about shortages of supply, questions about dependency. And so this is not going to be a low price transition or easy a geopolitically benign transition either. Hunter, when we look at, you know, you're a family company, what, 19 
34 um, back in Texas, but one of the biggest privately owned companies, you know, in terms of uh, an oil company. But you've done your own transition a little bit now. I mean, when we look at what you've done in terms of oil, gas, even beyond that, I mean, do companies like yourself have to become part of the transition as well to make sure that it is driven? Well, thank you. And thank you for the Atlantic Council for being part of the, this panel. Um, so I think the, the short answer is yes. Uh, we've been an oil and gas company since 1934. We're family owned. And so as the industry has transitioned, we've had to transition with it. It's the old saying, if you aren't changing as fast as your industry is, you're, you're, you're dying. So we are involved in, in electricity. We've owned a utility that's hooked up four gigawatts of wind in, in Texas. We're rolling out batteries across the state of Texas right now. Um, we're a leader in perovskite solar cells. So we've tried to keep up with the industry, but I'd like to build on the comments of their panelists. It, um, uh, you know, humanity does a, a lousy job of getting off of energy resources. I think other than whale oil, in absolute terms, we consume more of every energy source we've had. We actually burn more wood, more coal, more oil, more gas. We have more nuclear. And so, um, you know, this transition that we're talking about, it, sitting with kind of a foot in both camps is, is intriguing because I think there are a lot of stories on how you get to 2050 that just aren't simply going to work. And I think one of the biggest challenges that, that an industry player faces is there are no mile markers along the way. Um, if, if we're able, through humanity, to reduce oil demand from roughly 100 million barrels a day down to 80 million barrels a day in 2035, which would be unprecedented in human history as an effort, it's unclear whether we're celebrating that or whether the industry is being condemned for being a laggard. And I think that's the hard thing from an investment perspective to figure out how do you deploy capital. Indeed, we're going to talk a lot more about investment because I think that's something everybody has got something to say. Um, Mele Kiari, lovely to have you with us, and we're seeing you very clear. I hope your sound is also very clear, too. Now, Nigeria committed to net zero by 2060. Um, a lot still going on in terms of you're still a key oil producer. You're still dependent on this. Talk to me about, you know, where you're going to see the role of gas within the energy transition. And sort of bring us up to date. Give us a, a little report card, so to speak. Thank you very much, Jaden. And great, I'm not here physical, but unfortunately, I couldn't help. Uh, but first of all, let me put it in the, the right context. Uh, our country's GDP uh, contribution from the oil and gas is just 9%. So we're not really an oil-dependent economy. And, and secondly, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Statistics have estimated that by year 2047, Nigeria's population will be around 379 million people and would be the third most populous country in, in the world. Yeah, the combination of this is that uh, you have a very rapidly growing population with a huge uh, gap in terms of energy access, energy accessibility. Uh, you have huge economic uh, uh, disparity between the poor and the, and the, and the rich, and, and this is growing. And there's no way you can take the context of energy transition out of this. Our country is clearly committed to net zero by 2060. We are doing a number of things, and what this means to us is that to, to reduce our carbon footprint in a manner that will contribute to the net zero by 2060, and we will try to see the best that we can to make sure that we pull out the players that are in our country today. We move more of uh, our energy sources from, from thermal sources to, to other sources of energy. Yes, you do need about seven gigawatts of energy from the renewables every year to close this gap as we go forward. We are working towards that direction. But more than that, you know, uh, in, in terms of our supply of energy in our, in our country today, you know, majority, 70% of energy is for electricity, for instance, is coming from thermal sources. And these thermal sources, particularly in, in our country today, most of them are not coming from gas. The majority of them are coming from fuel oils and, and other dirty fuel. So what we are doing to do is some kind of replacement so that, you know, you move from the much more dirty fuel to cleaner fuel, which is gas. And therefore, our focus today now is to see gas as a transition fuel for, for, for us to achieve the net zero situation, in addition to the many things that we have to do around the renewables. And what do we plan to do? is to build the enormous gas infrastructure that is required to ensure that there's a no, a no, a no sufficient supply of gas into the domestic market, provide some for the international market. And, and more than that, within the West African context, you, know, you will see that energy deficiency and poverty that we see in Nigeria is also true in many of the African countries around us. And therefore, we're trying to see how we can build a, a network of pipelines and, and infrastructure that will deliver gas 
across the West African so, and potentially to jump into Europe through Morocco or through Algeria. This is what we are working on. And, and therefore, uh, overall, uh, this transition would take us in the direction of letting pay more attention to gas in the, in the sense that, you know, we are, we are a 203 trillion gas country, potentially 600 trillion gas, gas resources. This is enough to cover a lot of uh, needs across the West African region and, of course, also supply to the, to the world. Yes, it, you know, what it means to us is that uh, uh, the certification is real as we speak today. Majority of our, our country people uh, use uh, charcoal as cooking foil. Let me put in a very in the most rawest uh, form that I can, I can put forward. And that means you must find a replacement for this. And the replacement of this is typically using LPG or CNG. Anyhow you look at it, you know, you must have an immediate replacement of that over a period of time. And as we speak today, the desert encroaches southward in our country by three to four kilometers every year. This is nothing other than the effect of climate change, yes, but more importantly, the activities of men, or of man, whereby trees are cut down for the purpose of providing energy. So this is the first challenge we have to contain. And as we contain this, of course, you know, naturally, you know, the effect of cutting down trees is far more than what the internal combustion engine vehicles do. And uh, let me speak in another context also. Now. In our country today, mass transportation is very weak, and therefore the only way you can reduce the number of uh, of uh, internal combustion engines on the road is to increase on those uh, infrastructures. So it's a combination of many things that we have to do. It's in a very different context in this uh, in this country, in this part of the world. You have to do things that uh, to close a gap that is clearly very evident. And also as you move forward, uh, you can have an accelerated process probably by 2030. You will not be in a position to say, I can leapfrog into something different. Uh, and let me come back to you on the investment you. question that all is going to need a lot of investment. We'll come back to that in just a, a couple of minutes. But uh, Your Excellency Cherry, when we look at gas at the moment and what's happening here in the United Arab Emirates particularly, how close are we getting to self-sufficiency in gas and where's, where's the big push right now? It's a very exciting time, I would say, for the gas industry based on the prices that we are seeing, the unprecedented prices. Uh, on the other side of the coin, of course, it is uh, a, a, a concerning situation for the consumers, obviously. Um, and natural gas is part of our energy strategy. Uh, we developed this back in 2017, and it is based on uh, getting around 50% of the energy mix in the UAE coming from renewable and clean sources. Uh, the other 50% will be coming from fossil fuel-based uh, energy, 38% of which is natural gas. Of course, uh, the strategy was developed back in 2017, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, back then, we anticipated around 12% of the energy mix will be coming from coal. Now, this no longer is uh, valid. Uh, I think it was very well uh, announced that the al Hassan plant in Dubai has been converted from coal to natural gas. So we are currently working on uh, refreshing our energy strategy and taking into account a lot of the new introductions that are coming into the energy mix. When we talk about hydrogen, when we talk about waste to energy, biofuels. Um, from a gas perspective, we are definitely expanding on our gas portfolio. Our national oil company, ADNOC, has huge plans in terms of adding significant amounts of volume to ensure gas self-sufficiency for the entire UAE by 2030. In addition to that, they want to, ADNOC wants to strengthen its position as a reliable global supplier of oil and gas. We have a number of uh, projects that are in the pipeline, uh, multi-billion uh, standard cubic feet of gas that is being developed in high sour reservoirs and gas caps. And plus, I must mention over here is we do have an aggressive exploration program in the country, it being in Abu Dhabi or even in the Northern Emirates. Uh, just recently, there was an announcement by ADNOC and ENI in one of the offshore exploration blocks where there was a gas discovery. The same was in Sharjah in the Northern Emirates. So there's still so much to be done there at the moment. Um, uh, talk to us, uh, and we're on a little bit of a, a speed uh, round on this one, I'm just beginning to notice. Um, Secretary General, your world oil outlook says that up to almost close to $12 trillion is going to be needed, you know, by 2045, just to keep up in terms of the investment that's needed. Where's that going to come from? And what's the danger if you don't, if the industry doesn't get that money? That's a very good question and very timely one, because if you step back, 
to the previous cycle, 2015-2016, uh, uh, we had already registered, unfortunately, over 50% contraction in investments in the industry for those two consecutive years as a result of the impact of the downturn. And we had not recovered fully before COVID struck in 2020. And we saw in 2020, uh, in capital investments also contracted by about 30%, unprecedented in history, and stayed flat in 2021. Uh, now, our world oil outlook to 2045 uh, shows that the industry will need uh, in the upstream, in the midstream and downstream, about 11.8 trillion US dollars investments uh, to be able to catch up. Now, the jury is still out. Uh, the situation is evolving. It used to be daily, now we hear it's uh, hourly. And I think uh, Atlantic Council and the various uh, sessions uh, uh, that we have listened today, very, very resourceful, uh, will also help us in um, shaping up how this outlook will look forward. And again, I mean, I think it's the top of everybody's mind, you know, but again, we have to, as everybody was talking to, look to the future. Um, Dan, you know, the investment is the key at the moment. Maybe it's going to be forthcoming now, but again, there is a general lack of funding anything when it's got to do with oil at the moment. Gas, not so much. But what, what can be done and what's your advice to people? What would you like to see the investment community doing? Well, I think the investment community is doing what it needs to do, and I think the private sector is ready to do what it needs to do. But in, with regard to U.S. policy, or perhaps even the European policy, uh, we should um, be careful of the words that we use. And what I mean by that is that we tend to have this, uh, uh, this notion that oil and gas is going to go away in eight years as we look at 2030 or 2050. And it's very difficult from an investment community standpoint to invest a billion or two billion or 10 billion mm -hmm. if you know or you think that your industry may not survive the next eight years. So we have to resolve this with our rhetoric and resolve this with our public policy. And I think if we do that, then the investment will show up. Uh, because it was, as we just talked about, you know, oil and gas is absolutely critical to the adoption of renewable technologies at this moment in time. So as long as there's that complementary nature, uh, especially with regard to natural gas and you know, renewable technologies like solar and wind, you'll continue to see the investment come into this industry. And again, in terms of investment, Halim, I mean, the market reacts to, yes, a lot of sentiment, a lot of fundamentals at the moment. And again, right now, I think there's a lot of uncertainty out there right now. It's very volatile. But how do we bring that investment back? Oil and gas, yes, at um, these prices probably looks attractive. But what's going to happen in five years when we're really looking at demand that everybody projects has to come down, particularly in the oil sector? I do think that this crisis has essentially changed the conversation at the government level about what type of energy is going to be needed for the transition. And if you decide that gas is essential part of the transition, then you do need to make decisions now about infrastructure, about permitting, about what type of contract environment you're going to have. So I do think that this you know, terrible moment that the world is in right now we have to think about what lessons we learn from this and how do we basically plan in terms of decisions that will be made now in terms of the necessary enabling environment to ensure that supplies will be needed through this transition, that we do not have this volatile, rocky transition. Hunter, you're, you come from an investment banking background and pulled that together with oil. It's a, it's a great combination in this industry. It's not where everybody is. But again, it is. How big a problem is it? And how can you, what's your message to the investment community to actually get on board? Look, I think the investment community is very rational. And, you know, for the seven to 10 years prior to last year, the energy sector was the worst performing sector in the S&P 500. Um, you know, we're less than two years away from negative pricing for West Texas Intermediate Crude. And so, you know, there's, uh, with the ESG pressure that's been out there as well, access to capital for a number of players in the U.S. markets is actually, it's a difficult problem. And I mean, this is why, I mean, the, the estimates of a million barrels extra coming out of the U.S., I, I actually, I think it'll be closer to half of that 
just because th there's so many challenges that are involved. The inflation out in the oil patch right now is real. Um, I mean, we were seeing 15 to 20% inflation back in December before all this hit. Um, and so a, as you look forward, um, I mean, clearly it, as a transition, we need to be moving into newer fuels and clearly gas is far cleaner than oil. I, I will just make a, a quick comment on, on energy poverty and economic poverty. You know, one of my lasting impressions of, it, we, we have an LNG project in Peru where we were visiting a couple of the villages along the pipeline route. And we went to a village where uh, it was quite poor and looking at some of the, the social work we'd done. And I was asking the person there who was leading us, well, how poor is this village? And he said, well, poor. And I was like, well, how poor? Like a dollar a day per capita? And he said, oh, no, 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 much wealthier than that. And I said, well, how much? And he said, two. Then we went up to a, a village that was even poorer. And he said the difference was the, the lower village had a communal truck that they could actually gather their goods and go to market and become a price maker of sorts. The village up top had no access to transportation. A truck would show up and quote them a price for their, their guinea pigs or potatoes and say, take it or leave it. And I think that's the side of energy justice that people forget. Mobility is what will drive people out of poverty and it's not gonna be Tesla's running up the mountains. It's going to be internal combustion engines for quite a long time as it should be. Uh, Mele, if I can bring you in, it's probably a topic very close to your heart in terms of the just transition, you know, the investment that's needed to make sure that there is a just transition, and particularly when we look at countries in Africa. How concerned are you at the moment that there's not enough investment around or that the danger is that there won't be? Yeah, I think it's very clear that differentiation is very important in today's context as we take this route towards the net zero by 2050 or 2060. Uh, needless to say that, you know, countries have different circumstances, particularly in, in West African sub-region or in the African sub-region in, in general. And therefore, total lack of investment in the, in the, in the fossil fuel silk sector will simply mean uh, some kind of exclusion for a very, very large population uh, in Africa. And of course, uh, on a global scale, you know, very many other nations will have the same, same effect. Therefore, uh, this bandwagon you know, approach of uh, we're going to stop an investment in the fossil fuel so that we can put into the renewable won't work because in the sense that today, uh, we have much more basic problem in sub-Saharan Africa than just worrying about uh, uh, EVs. You know, we are not in the EV age, you know, definitely not in electricity supply is the weakest. Uh, less than 30% of the population have access to uh, clean electricity. And therefore, you, know, you need to fill this gap. And there's simply no way you can do this in the scale of the investment that you're seeing in the renewables, uh, where you require probably at least 70 gigawatts, in my own country alone, at least 7 gigawatts of renewable uh, power uh, every year until 2060 for you to cover this gap. So, it's simply the world must sit back and take a second look at it. Can we differentiate this? Can the cleaner energy come you know, much later for some countries? Can we fund fossil fuels so that resources can be available to some countries so that they can fund the transition journey itself? And also, you know, can we really you know, segregate and say, look, we are going to fund gas development in certain countries or in certain locations so that they can provide much cleaner fuel than what is practical and what is much more quicker? And also in the context, in, for instance, in the West African sub-region today, now we know also that the, the situation is not any different. A few countries are a little better, but overall, uh, energy poverty is real in, in the West African sub-region and in most of Africa. Can we use the resources of gas that are available in some countries, particularly my country, to see that we can energize West African sub-region and the rest of the Africa so that that energy poverty gap can be filled up very, very quickly so that as we also move towards uh, a much, much cleaner fuel in, in the future. And of course, we all know that... Uh, Gas peak is uh, still uh, many, many years away, at least 2030, 2040. Many estimates are coming on the table. But even if you take it at 2030, that you are still very, very far away from the reality that you are, you are, you are, out, you are at the gas peak uh, level. So having a look at all this uh, situation, it is very important for the world to sit back and say, look, what can we do about energy transition in much more uh, weaker countries, you know, particularly where you know, energy poverty is much, much uh, pronounced. And without doing this, you know, you will see the scale yes. of uh, environmental hazard that we're seeing today in terms of uh, uh, desertification and all this. That was so clearly there must be some kind of differentiation. And I think this is the right. Place. And that has to be done. Your Excellency Sharif, just a quick closing word from you. I think, uh, uh, I, think I would uh, emphasize on the fact that uh, uh, our current reservoirs see a decline of 8% on average. And uh, this is without any investments. 
So uh, this is much more of a reduction compared to any plausible uh, reduction in demand, in global demand. And that's why investing in the oil and gas sector is just crucial. Uh, it is tied up with our investments in the other angle is uh, renewables and green energy sources. Petrochemical products actually support that angle. So my advice and my uh, strong message over here is, is we should not disconnect the two. It is an energy mix. We need both. Dan, in your role now, I mean, and having looking back with your experience in the government, I mean, again, we need clearer policy. What would you say to um, the policymakers out there right now? What can they do quickly? Rebalance the equation. Stop looking at energy policy solely through the singular prism of climate policy. Uh, in, 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 importantly, look at energy security and look at the security in light of the events today and make sure that we have a balanced equation and a balanced transition going forward. Um, and Halima, just again, what needs to be done now that can get us to a better space? Well, RBC Capital Markets actually sponsored an Atlantic Council report on critical minerals. And I do think it's really important as we think out into the transition, how do we secure the sort of ethical, you know, stable supplies of these inputs that we're going to need for the transition? And we need to start thinking about them now. Um, Mr. Barkindo, I'm leaving you the closing word because, as I said, we won't see you at the Atlantic Council in your role as Secretary General. You've been with us for so many years. OPEC Plus is there. A few quick words in terms of the future. Yes, I want to use this opportunity to thank my colleagues at uh, Atlantic Council for an excellent uh, journey since we started this uh, session six years ago. I had participated in each and every one and I look forward to continuing to participate in my new role as a distinguished fellow of the council. Uh, and I'm sure the best is yet to come. Atlantic Council is the most important think tank, not only in the United States, but in the world that has been contributing to scholarship, to knowledge, to policy making. Uh, in addition, I would like to use this opportunity also to call on the authorities of Egypt, uh, the host of COP27, and the authorities of the Emirates, the host of COP28, to begin to redefine the conversation right away. I think there's a strategic opportunity here for the global community and for the energy transition that these two cops are holding back to back in these two countries uh, has the potential of addressing the challenges that we have been talking about. The inclusiveness uh, to ensure that no sector is left behind uh, to address the issue of investments in the industry and to reset the conversation and agree that achieving the climate goals of capping uh, temperature rises at 1.5 and the role of oil and gas are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it can be achieved. Uh, and I think this is the responsibility that is now on the shoulders of the UAE and Egypt. And we are confident that they will be able to overcome and lead the world to a more sustainable transition going forward. Please give them a big round of applause here.